Today's daf we're going to be learning is Gitin, daf Yud Aleph. Today's daf is sponsored by Jill and Jeff Shames in memory of Avi Moli, William Baker, Zev Velvel Ben Khanav Ruvan on his second year at side. Dad, still missing your loving embrace. Your memory is a blessing. This is the daf for Shabbat. We're going to get started on a quick review of where we ended yesterday. So we saw a Mishnah on daf Yud Amabet that any star that was done in a Gentile court works even if they're signed by Gentiles, but not for get an emancipation document of a slave. Rabbi Shimon says, no, even that works. Okay, and then we tried to figure out, and then we had this line, which we have to figure out today, which is, lo huskeru ela bizman shenasu behediot. Only if it was done by a hediot, a regular person, is it a problem. But in a court, it's totally fine. So let's go through. Again, review. If it's regular money documents, well, of course, if it's done in the court, they have their name to stand up to. They're not going to lie. What's the problem with Get and Shikor Evid? Well, they're not part of that whole, right? This is a more Jewish thing. The Gentile slaves that kind of work in your house and become part of your family and, and become semi-Jewish, right? When you free them, they become Jewish. That's a whole unique Jewish concept. So is Get, right? Obviously, there's divorce, but this type of the way to do a Get is a uniquely Jewish thing. So there, Gentile signatures don't work. However, Rabbi Shimon thinks they work. And why do they work? And then we explained at the bottom of the doc yesterday, they work because it's really not that they work. It's that we hold like Rabbi Elazar, or Rabbi Shimon holds like Rabbi Elazar, the Edi Masir Karte, we actually hold that way also. It's important the ones who see the get being given. It's not so much the importance of the dot, of the signatures on the shtar. What about Rabbi Elazar, um, what about Rabbi Abba, who says that, Rabbi Lezal agrees that Mizuyaf Mitocho Shu Pasul, if you have disqualified witnesses, it doesn't work. That's only because we're worried that maybe you'll rely on them. Maybe, okay, there's two issues of why you might rely on them. Either you won't have Adi Masira around and you'll just say, oh, the Khatimot are good, which would be a problem if they're Gentiles. And Rashi actually says here, the very last words in Rashi, on Daf Yudam Abet. If you have disqualified witnesses signing the Shtar, we're worried that maybe we'll use them to actually give the get. Maybe once they're signed, maybe we'll say, oh, you could be the same ones to also write. It's like at the wedding. If somebody signs the ketuba, you might use them for Adi Kiddushin, who stand up under the chuppah and say, oh, you're married, right? I see that you gave her the ring and you're married. So the whole issue here is that we're worried that you might actually rely on those witnesses. So then how could that possibly be? If they're Gentile witnesses, it's a problem. To which they answer, Ah, and that gets us to the top of our daf, b'shemot mufakim. It's names that are so clearly Gentile that there's no way anyone will think it's a Jew. In which case, if no one's going to think it's a Jew, then obviously you're never going to rely on them. You're not going to use them as Adi Masira. And, and if there, we can't find the Adi Masira, you're not going to say, oh, we have a document with signatures, all, the, all is good. Because clearly no one's going to think we can rely on that. And that's why it even works for getting a Shemin Shekhar Abedim. To which the Gemara asks right now, which I told you yesterday, we we're going to ask this question, what are names that are clearly Gentile names? Now, you might be expecting certain names, but no, that's not what you're going to hear. Amra Papa Kegon, Hormiz, Vavudaina, Bachivta, Barkidre, Ubate, Venakim Una. Okay, names that obviously were popular in those times. Maybe Hermes is a name you've heard of, but none of the other names we've ever really heard of, at least I never did. But in those days, obviously, those were popular names. Avash, Shemot, Enam, Vakim, Mai. Low. So now we're going to say that in first. If the names are not clearly Gentile names, they're Gentile names, but it's not clear that only Gentiles have those names. Some Jews have those names also, right? Most of us who um, live abroad, for example, many of us have English names and Jewish names. Right? My name, Michelle, is definitely not a Jewish name. I have a Jewish name that I don't even use. Um, nothing to do with Michelle. It's a, it's a Hebrew name, right? So I have a Hebrew name and an English name. So... So now we're going to say if there's a name that could be Jewish, could be Gentile. So we're going to assume it's no good. Well, if that's the case, the Misha should have mentioned it, right? Notice what the Misha does mention and what the Misha doesn't mention. Because the Misha then says, again, assuming this line is Rabbi Shimon. Let's just go back to the Misha. Rabbi Shimon says, even these are good. It's only if they're done with a head yoke that it's a problem. Okay? Which sounds like, so now, Lois Kuruela Bismanch and Asuba head yoke, it's saying this only works in the case where it's from a court, not if it's from a non, not from a court. Well, Liflo Gulit Nebedita should have said there also, if she, there's a distinction between Shemov Vakim and Shemov Shemov Vakim, if they're telling you it works in their code of Gentiles, 
courts of Gentiles, but it only works if it's a clear Gentile name that no Jews have that name. Well, it should have said, in what case are we talking about? Only if it's clear names that only Gentiles have. But if it's names that are not Muvakim, then it shouldn't work. And it didn't say that in the Mishnah. So to answer that question, we're going to have two answers. One is to change the wording in the Mishnah, which we do often. Hachinami kamar, in other words, so is usually a last resort. Well, that's really what it says. Bamed varim amurim, b'shemot muvakim, add these words into the Mishnah. When does this work? If it's shem muvak. Ava b'shemot she'em muvakim, na'aseh kemisha na'asu b'hediyot u'psuli. It is if it was done like a hediyot, and it's disqualified. Meaning, if it's done by a hediyot, of course it doesn't work. If you did it with names that could be Jews, could be Gentiles, and we don't know which it is, then there's a concern that, again, what's the concern? That maybe people were lying in it, maybe it really was a Gentile name, and therefore it's going to be a problem. And therefore it's treated like it wasn't done in the court, and it's actually disqualified. And that's how they reread the mission. So that's one way to explain that line. But another way to explain that line is to d- detach that line from Rabbi Shimon and say that that's not actually Rabbi Shimon speaking. Rabbi Shimon says in the Mishnah, Af Eluk Sheri. These are also fine as long as they're Shemot Mufakim, okay? And it just doesn't mention them. But that's what it means. And then, Lois Kuru Ela Bismach Nasuba Hediot is not talking about Get Nashim and Shechor Avadim. It's talking about the other kind of Shtarot, all the other ones, like a sale, where, what's the difference? There, the signature is used just as a proof document, right? So, Ibayit Ema Sefa Atan Legite Mamo. Some people say that line is talking about monetary documents, not get and emancipation documents. The hachi kama, and this is what it says. Los kalum gitem amon de psulim elabiz manchin asu behegyot. When they say the gitem amon de psulim, it's specifically when they're done with a regular person. Because again, why do we trust the court when they're bringing this proof document? We trust the court because the court isn't going to write a proof document if it wasn't really true. But if it's a hegyot, he doesn't have that same sense of what if I lie? It's not as big a deal, although we'll see later, maybe some disagree with this. But that line is talking about regular documents are only if they came out of a Gentile court, but not if regular Gentiles just signed on it. We don't trust them. Tanya. Now we're going to have Rabbi Elazar says, Amar Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Yossi, Kach Amar Rabbi Shimon L'Chachamim B'Tzaydam. We're now going to have another more elaborate version of, of Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon said to the rabbis, he was arguing with them about this point. Again, let's just review. The rabbis said, we can accept Gentile courts for monetary documents, but not divorce or emancipation. And Rabbi Shimon said, it's accepted across the board. Okay, and we're assuming now it's accepted across the board. Again, there was this debate about the head yot. Maybe all of them are only accepted if they're done in the court, but not individuals. Or maybe the individual part was referring to, right, only part of the statement, not the whole thing. Anyway, we'll leave that aside for right now, but I wanted to point it out because here we're going to have some other way of understanding the Hediot. So Rabbi Shimon said to the Chamim in Saidan, that's a place which is now in Lebanon, Lo Rabbi Akiva v'chachamim al kol ha'olim kochavim. The rabbis and Rabbi Akiva in his previous generation, the one right before Rabbi Shimon, says they all agreed that shtarot that come out of a Gentile court, all shtarot, Okay, we're going to say this now. Even though they're signed by Gentiles, if it came from a Gentile court, everyone agreed to that. Okay, he's basically saying to the rabbis, you're wrong in thinking to make this distinction because everyone in the previous generation agreed that that's not a problem. So if so, then obviously, if he's pointing out Rabbi Akiva and the rabbis, they must have disagreed about something. Their debate was only if it was outside the court. And now we're going to see that there's a debate about outside the court. Okay, let's start from the end. are even permitted Why are they permitted behedyo? Because, again, we're not relying on them for anything. We're relying on Edi Mesira. So the fact that there's Gentile signed, it doesn't make a difference. Now, again, you can assume, and this commentaries point out, some of them anyway, that we must be talking about Shemot Mufakim, because if they're not Mufakim, we're back to square one, and that we don't know if it's Jew or Gentile, and that's more of a problem, because maybe they'll rely on them, and maybe it turns out they're a Gentile. But if it's clear Gentile name, it doesn't matter, court, not court, it'll be accepted, because in the end, we're relying on the Adim that saw the get being given to the woman, which was the most important part, because we call the Krabi Lazat. 
But what's their debate? Well, if the document of the monetary document was done by a hediot, Rabbi Akiva says, Machshil, we trust the hediot also. Any Gentile has his reputation on the line. He's not going to sign a document unless it's true. And Chachamim Puslim, they say, no, 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 only a court, an individual, we're suspicious of. And then we have a third thing. Okay, so we had, they don't disagree about this, right? They all agree that um, that if it's done in Erkaot, it's fine for, across the board for everything. They disagree about Hedyot when it comes to monetary. They still all agree about get, even if it's a Hedyot, a regular person, that it's fine. Rashba Gomel, af eluk shirim b'makom she'en Yisrael chotmim. He says, this is only true, though. When we say it's all fine and good, it's in a place for the get and the Shekhor Eved, where Jews don't generally sign documents. Then we can assume, and this maybe shows maybe it's not Shemo Bufakim, but if Jews don't sign documents, now Rashi says, what do we mean by this? We mean it's a place where the Gentiles don't allow Jews to sign documents. They don't. They just say, you can't sign documents. So if that's the case, then we're going to assume it's obviously a Gentile. Avaba, makam shisrael chotmim lo. But if it's a place where the Jews sign, then it's more of a problem. Okay? So now, because then again, we're back to square one. We don't know, is it a Jew or is it a Gentile? So now the Gemara says, wait a minute. If we're going to distinguish between places and say a place like this, it's okay. A place like that, it's not okay. Well, then we have a question. They say, If it's a place where they don't sign, well, then you should make a gzera and say, even though Jews don't sign here, if we allow it here, you might come to allow it in a place where Jews do sign. So maybe we should forbid it. To which they answer, Shma bishma michlif. Okay, people might confuse names with other names. And if we allow certain names, you might come to confuse and think other names are okay. And that is a problem. But atra ba'atra, and therefore we're going to forbid. But atra ba'atra lo michlif. But we're not going to have people confuse this location and that location. If, if things are done differently in this town and they're done in that town, we can understand that there's distinctions in the law. And we're not going to say, just because it's permitted here, it's permitted there. That kind of thing we don't worry about. Ravina Sevalach Shurei B'Knufiyat Adaramai. Okay, there were Arameans who had this ad hoc court. It wasn't a real court. It wasn't Erkaot. It was an ad hoc court. Knufiyah is when they get together. Right? In Hebrew, right? A Knufiyah is a gang. That's where people gather together. So here, he wanted to permit it in this group of people that got together to make an ad hoc court. Amar le'raflam Erkaot. Now, Raflam said, no, no, no. It has to be something formal. Okay, here you see, now the question is, what are they referring to? Some people say they're referring to the mamon according to the rabbis. In other words, because we already said, get nashim and all that is even fine in if it's not erkaot. So maybe what they're referring to is monetary documents where we said it has to be done in a Gentile court according to the rabbis against Rabbi Akiva who said even if it's not in a court. But, in other words, again, the rabbis said it had to be done in a court. So what does court mean? Court means they generally hold court there and not that they decided one time to have a, an ad hoc court. I'm a Rav. Rav gives an example now. Okay, maybe it wasn't a particular case, but he says if there was a star written in Parsit, Persian, and it was given in front of Jewish witnesses, again, they, okay, so you owe me money, and you pass the shah to me saying I owe you in front of two Jewish witnesses. But the, the document was written by Persians and presumably signed by them. Persians. Magbina me I can then collect the money from free property. What does free property mean? Free as opposed to Mishuabad, which is property with a lien on it. Okay, what does that mean? This means that if you owe me money and we had a okay, if we did it balpe orally. I can only collect from free property. Free property means property that's in your possession right now. So I can only take it from property that you have. But if we had a star written out in general, not a star per se, because star per se is going to be different. But if we have a regular star, a regular document, an IOU, signed by Jewish witnesses, given in front of Jewish witnesses, all is good. I can go collect that money. And it's from the moment of the, the document any property that you have in your hands at the time of the document, if you sell to somebody else, I can demand it back from them. Let's say I go to collect the money and you say, I don't have any money. Well, I can go take any property that you had in your possession at the time of the loan that you sold to somebody else. I can just go to them and say, listen, this is mine. 
How does this work? Well, it works based on the fact that when they, you might say that's very unfair to them, but when they bought the land, their job is to check, is there any lien on the property? And the assumption is that once there's a star, and that's why there has to be a star, if it was an oral agreement, there's no way they would necessarily know. Once there's a star, there's an assumption that yesh lezek kol, people know. People hear about these things, word gets around, because word gets around, the person has a way to find that out. So when they go to buy the land, let's say the land is worth a million dollars, they're going to buy it for less money because they're going to say, but look, you have a loan out with Michelle and maybe she'll have to collect it from me. So you're going to end up buying that for $900,000, let's say, because you're going to say, look, that land is worth less than, than what, you know, what, what it really is because you, I might end up, you know, getting this land taken away if you don't pay back your loan to Michelle. So that's the way the whole thing works with Nechassim Shoabadim. Now come, and they come here and they say, Rava says, if it's a Shtar Parsi, though, a Persian document written in Persian, but Jewish witnesses watch the transaction. If you give it to me, well, I can collect the money, but only from free property of yours. Okay, so it's valid, but limited. So now they want to understand why. So the first thing is, why is it valid at all? Vahalo yadala mikra. But the Jews can't read Persian, so they don't even know what's written. And so how could they serve as witnesses to this transaction that went on when they have no idea what it even says in the document? It must be a case where they know Persian. Okay, obviously there were Jews who knew Persian in those days. But wait, there's two other issues, which is there's rules about documents of Jews that we have rules in our courts that the Persians clearly don't have those same rules. Now, what are they? Well, both are to prevent forgeries. What are we worried about? If you give me the document, the IOU, and I keep it in my possession, if it's parchment that I can erase, I can change instead of 400, instead of 100, you know, 400 shekel, I can change it to 800 shekel, right? I can erase it and fix it. So you need it to be written in a way that it can be forged, which means you have to treat the parchment in a particular way, almost like maybe a shellac. You would put this gall on it and that would make sure that you can't erase. To which they answer, why do you assume in the Persian document doesn't have it? You could say it, but it would, this would only be if it was a Persian document that they did this. They treated it with the gall. Another thing they did to prevent forgeries. The document was generally written with the signatures at the bottom. Now, sometimes there was empty space. Now, what's the problem with empty space? Once the document's in my hand, I could write in all sorts of things if I wanted. Even if it was treated and I couldn't erase, I could add, and I could add a whole nother line. So the rabbi said, any star has to have that space filled in by a summary of what the top part says. And the Persians don't do that in their documents. So again, how can I demand the money? Maybe I'm lying. Maybe I added some extra line. To which the answer, again, it would be a case where I added, they added the text in, they did do that. Okay? And then there's no concern. To which they say, okay, well, if this document is, a, is number one, the Jews understood what they were reading, right? What, the, what was in the document when they watched the transaction happen. So they're good witnesses. And the, the parchment is treated properly. And the concern for forgery of adding another line is not there. Well, then it should be a perfectly good document. In which case, the other direction is, I should be able to collect it from even lead property because it's a perfectly good document. Why are we limiting my ability? First, they wanted to know why can I even collect it. Now they're saying, why are we limiting my collection of it? And let's say you don't have the money, I'll be stuck. Late, late, Kala. Well, the reason is things that come out of Persian courts don't get around. The Jews know what goes on in the Jewish courts, but there's no, the, the rumors aren't spread. The word doesn't get around about this kind of thing. And the whole idea is that when, when your friend bought the piece of land from you, they needed to check what the story was and they would have no way of knowing if it was about they're going to check every Persian court also besides all the Jewish courts. They would have no way of knowing. And therefore, that's why I can't collect from lien property because if you don't know there was a lien on it when you bought it, well, then it's unfair for me to collect it from you. We're going to have two versions of what Rish Lakish has Rabbi Yochanan. The first version is the following. You'll find this interesting, I think. Turning now to Amubet. Edim achatumim alaget ushmotehen kishmot of dekochavim mal. What if there's witnesses signed and their names that are like Gentile names, but also Jews have those names. So now we have people signed on a get. Okay, what's interesting is nowadays, if right, we, many of you live abroad, and even if you don't, you know people with English names and Hebrew names. And 
generally when they sign on official documents like a ketubah, you know, Jewish documents, they're going to sign with their Hebrew name, not their English name. But here it seems like people maybe didn't have two names like we do nowadays, or even if they did, they went by their Gentile name when they signed on documents. So now we have witnesses signed, and their names are Gentile names, but they could be Jewish names, and we don't know. So what does he say? Can we? Now here comes the fascinating thing, because if we know, if there's a star with Jewish signatures, obviously it's a good star, right? We're talking about, let's say, a get. The get is totally fine. On the other hand, if we have Gentile names that we know are Gentiles, it's also fine because we're not worried we're going to rely on the signatures. So we end up with, right, the two extremes are clearly fine, but the suffix in the middle becomes a problem. If we're not sure if it's true or Gentile, we get stuck because it could be then you might end up relying on the signatures and it could be they'll end up being Gentiles. So that's where we actually get stuck. It's very fascinating because if we know for sure they're Gentiles, no one will rely on them, and actually it's totally fine. The problem becomes when we're not sure what it is. So again, your suffix, your doubt case, is actually more strict than both the, what it actually, what, if we knew what it actually was, it would be fine either which way. But yet the case of doubt is strict. This happens once in a while. So now, that's what he wants to know. The only two names that we permitted was Lucas which means wolf, or loose, which means lion, okay, but they were names of people, Lucas sounds like Luke, right, which are clearly Gentile names. Jews don't have those names. No Jews go by those names. But other names that could be Jews, could be not, that we can't do, and that's exactly for what I explained before. To which Etive Rish Lakish questions him. Wait, that was your answer, Rabbi Yochanan? But it says in the following Tosefta, Gitina ba'im imidina hayam, gets that come from abroad. Ve'idim chatumim alehem, and there's witnesses signed on them. Af apisha shmotehem keshmot of dei kochavim kshereim. Since they come from abroad, and there's a get. But we assume what? We assume how, who's likely signed on a get? A Jew. And since Rov, now here we go by the majority, most Jews who live abroad, they have Gentile names. Therefore, since chances are a get was signed by a Jew, and since even though the name is Gentile, we assume most Jews there have Gentile names, you can assume it's fine. But, right, and that's because, right, here you see, specifically you can rely on it. And, Rish, and Rabbi Yochanan, in answer Rish Lakish, you can't rely on it. Right, you can't assume majority of people, their names are of Dei Kochavim. To which they answer, There it says, it's based on this principle of Rov, of the majority of people there. But notice, now it doesn't say that continuation here, but the assumption is, Rabbi Yochum and Rish Lakish were living in Israel. And there you can't assume that most of the people, right, like you have nowadays, most people in Israel, their names are not Gentile names. Sometimes you meet some people with non-Jewish names, but most of the time, it's Hebrew names. So, the idea is that we're going to distinguish in Israel when you have it, there's more of a chance it's Gentile and therefore it's more of an issue. If it comes from abroad, where the, right, again, we can assume it was probably, a get must be probably signed by a Jew. And the fact that most of them have Gentile names, you can assume by majority rules that it's fine. Okay, and that's the distinction they make. V'ika de Amre, some people say, that actually, Rishlakish's question was specifically the issue they brought up in the, in the Tosefta. That if the get comes from afar and is aiding, what right with a non-Jewish name, can we assume it's Jewish or not? To which he answered, Pasha Lehman Matnita, and he answered him from the Tosefta that yes, it's fine because of the rov. And then he's only dealing with that. It wasn't a case where there was a question on something else. He answered it and then raised a question from the Tosefta, but he actually asked the question of the Tosefta, and then Rabbi Yochanan said, Oh, it's an explicit Tosefta, and here's your answer. New Mishnah. Now we're getting into a bit of a different topic. The husband sends a get to his wife or an emancipation document to his slave, and he sends it with a messenger. That's called a shaliyah holacha. He's a messenger that's supposed to deliver it to the woman. The woman herself can send a shaliyah kabbalah. She can send a messenger on her behalf to accept the get. And once her shaliyah kabbalah accepts the get, it's a done deal. The question is, when the husband gives it to his shaliyah to send, is it already as if it's hers? Now, why would we assume it's hers already? Well, there's a principle that if you send me a gift, with someone else. I don't even know the gift is coming. As soon as you give that gift, you actually can't change your mind. And that's going to be the big question here. 
At what point can the husband change his mind or not? Is it once he gives it to the messenger, he can't change his mind? Or is it once it gets to me or my shaliach kabbalah, he can't change his mind? So the issue has to do with a principle that comes up by gifts, which is if someone gives a gift to me, a gift I, right, that it's good for me, zachit l'adam shalom b'fanav. Once you give that gift to the messenger, it's mine because that messenger can take, can acquire it on my behalf because it's good for me. But if they're giving you something that's bad for me, it's only until it gets to my hands that it's mine. Okay? That's the principle. Zachim la'adam shalom b'fanav. You can do it for a person if it's a zchud, if it's good for them, even if they're not there or don't know about it. Ve'ein chavin la'adam shalom b'fanav. But we don't do something that's bad for them unless it actually gets to them or in this case, if she sent her own messenger, then it would also be as if she accepted it. So the Mishnah says, Ha'omer t'nu gets elishti. So here's the case. The man makes a shaliach holachat. He appoints a shaliach to bring the get to the woman. Ushtar shechor zelavdi. Or an emancipation document to his slave. Im bratzah lachzor b'shnehem yachzor devar Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir says neither of them is accepted until it actually gets to the woman or again to one of her messengers that she sent to accept it on her behalf. Meaning it's not at all accepted. But chachamim omrim begitei nashim avalo b'shechor avadi. Beget, in a get case, it's not a get until she gets it. But in, a, in an emancipation document, as soon as you give it to the shaliach, the person is free. Why is that? Because you can do good things for a person when they're not there, but not things that are a hold for them, that create an obligation for them or something bad. So what if, why is a divorce bad for a woman, but an emancipation document is good? Well, if you want to decide you don't want to feed your slave when he's your slave, you actually can do that. But you can't decide not to feed your wife. So therefore, when you emancipate the slave, he gets his freedom. And it's not like you're making him lose out because if you didn't want to give him food when he was a slave, you could have. So the fact that now he doesn't get food from you isn't really a loss. It's only a gain, which is his freedom. Now, the woman might gain her freedom, but she loses the food and that's money. So it's a monetary problem for her to get the get because she's actually losing out on the daily food that she'd be getting for the rest of her life while she would stay married. So Amar Lahem, Rabbi Meir says to them, what are you talking about? Why did Rabbi Meir say the husband can still change his mind? Because he views this as a hope for the slave also. Because for example, if, the Kohen, if it was a Kohen who owned the slave, the slave gets to eat truma as long as he's the slave. But as soon as he, he emancipates the slave, the slave can't eat truma anymore because he's not part of the Cohen's family. So just like the wife can't eat truma, also the slave can't eat truma, and therefore the slave should also be considered a chof. And you shouldn't be able to, right, just by giving it to the messenger, shouldn't, the messenger isn't zacheb, you know, on his account. Amrulo mipneshu kinyano. They said, no, that's an indirect result. It's not a direct result. What happens? Why doesn't he get the truma anymore? Because he only gets the truma because it's considered the property of the, of the owner. Once he's no longer, once he's freed, he's no longer the property of the owner and therefore he doesn't get the truma. But it's, it's very indirect. It's not a direct result and therefore that's not considered a chov. Okay? It's not considered a, an obligation for him. Now the Gemara tells a story. Rav Huna and Rav Yitzchak Bar Yosef were sitting in front of Rav Yirmiya. The yet of Rabbi Yirmiya become a nominee. There's a bunch of stories like this. Rabbi Yirmiya falls asleep. In the meantime, the rabbis continue their discussion. Yet of Rav Huna v'Kama. Rav Huna says, "Shema minami de Rabbanim." From the opinion of the rabbis in this Mishnah, that we distinguish between the woman and the and the slave, and the slave basically gets his freedom right as soon as the husband gives the star to the 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 messenger. You can learn from here how to face the Baal Chov Kana, a different halacha, but related, somewhat related. If you owe me money and my friend comes along and goes into your possession and takes the money that you owe me, seizes it for me. So from here you can learn, similar, it's different, but since they can take it, right, even against right here, the, they can basically take the money and acquire it on my behalf. Okay, that's coming out of this concept of zachin ladam shalom b'fana. Basically, even if I don't know about it, they can take something that's good for me from you. They can intercede on my behalf, take it from you, just kind of like it's a little different, but kind of like the slave, um, the messenger. The messenger takes on behalf of the slave, 
And even though the slave doesn't even know it's coming his way, it's valid. So therefore, sounds like you can go take money from someone who owes me money for me. That's what Rafuna said. But wait, is that true? Can my friend Jane, let's say, go take money from you that you owe me when you actually owe money to Joe and, and David as well? Okay, now, because when Jane takes the money from you, she's actually creating a loss for Joe and David, potentially, because maybe you don't have enough money to return to everybody. And then by her taking from me, that causes a loss for other people. So when she's doing just good and it's just for me and that's fine, I'm the only one, it, of course, but can she do it also when it causes others a loss? To which, right? Because theoretically, if I take the money myself, I could see that I could cause a loss to Joe and, and, and Dave, David because that's me. But can, some, I, can I send a messenger that causes, or, or can they do it without my knowledge and cause a loss to somebody else? It's actually a very interesting question. To which they say, right? So Amr Le'in, he says, yeah, also that. Now, in the meantime, Rabbi Yirmiya wakes up. Somehow heard what they were talking about, even though he was sleeping. Amr lehu, he says to them, Dari hachi Rabbi Yochanan. He says, children, like, you don't know what you're talking about. This is Rabbi Yochanan said. lo kana. If you take money for someone else, in a case where there's other people who are obligated to get money back from them, you know, who are owed money, that doesn't work. And if you want to prove from our Mishnah, our Mishnah doesn't prove anything. Why is that? Because when he said tnu, give this get, that's as if he's saying the word zechu, acquire it on her behalf or, or take it, right? Well, again, it doesn't work for the get because it's not a zechut, it's chov. But it works for the emancipation because he says the word tnu. It's like saying zechu. That's different. If he says, and if I give someone something and I say, acquire this on behalf of somebody else, then even in a place where Chavla Cherim, of course it's going to work. But, right, that's not the same as someone else who just comes and randomly takes it. These are not the same cases. So he disagrees. I'm a Rav Chista. Rav Chista now says, and this is something we're going to argue about tomorrow in tomorrow's class, but we'll finish up with this. You want to know what the answer to this question is? Can they take it on my behalf? without my knowing about it, when there's a loss to Joe and David? Well, it's a machlok of Rebbe of Rabbanah. And their machlok has to do with a charity case. Ditnan, as it says in the Mishnah, Misha liketa tapea, the corner of the field is left for the poor people. Let's say someone goes and collects for me, I'm poor, they go and collect and they take from me. Now the idea is the poor people are supposed to go and take their stuff. What if someone else collects? Now obviously, when they collect it for me, they're causing a loss to all the other poor people who could have collected it for themselves. Now they won't get it. Right? It's, I think, always think of this example of saving a parking spot, right? Saving a parking spot for someone always seems unfair. It's true you got there first, but you got there first by foot, not, not by driving. The way parking spots work is whoever gets there first gets it. Same thing with payout. Whoever gets it, gets it. Now, if someone takes for you, that's almost like cheating. It's not exactly fair. Okay? Again, there's two sides of the story. Some of them might say, what do you mean? We got here first. We're saving the spot. It's fair. So it's a good question. So they say here. So he collects the pay and says, this is for, I'm collecting this for Michelle. Rabbi Leezer, Rabbi Leezer, Rabbi Rabbi Leezer says this works even though it's Chav L'Acherim. And Chachamim Amblim, it's Nena La'ani, and it's Sarishon. Chachamim say, no, 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 it goes to the first poor person he finds. Okay, you can't, right, we're assuming this person wasn't poor, and he has to give it to the first poor person that shows up. You can't save it for other people. Okay, very interesting question. So with that, we're going to finish. Tomorrow they're going to say, is this really the one and the same? Anyway, right now, just to do a quick review, first we dealt with Rabbi Shimon in the Mishnah and what exactly he holds and how that last line, is it Rabbi Shimon or is it referring back to the rabbis and it's talking about Gitei Mamon and not Gitei Nashim, right? Shtarot of monetary, Shtarot and not get of a woman and how we understood the issue of the head Yotod and then we saw Bright again, which kind of ex expanded the exactly on what they're debating Rabbi Shimon and the rabbis in which cases exactly and what, right, and what his argument was against the rabbis. Then we had um, Shtar Parsa'a, right? The, we had the Shtar of the Persians and 
whether right would that work and why would it work but yet it only works to collect from free money not from not free money again that was all monetary issues then we went back to this question Rabbi Yochanan Rabbi Rabbi Yochanan what do we do about names that could be Gentile could be Jews we talked about the fact that the Sefei case is actually worse than both Vada'i cases um, that if it's definite it would actually be okay in both cases both extremes but the middle case where it could be either or is actually more problematic and then we actually had two versions of what Rabbi Rishla Kish asked Rabbi Yochanan, whether we distinguish between Israel and outside of Israel or not. And then we had this Mishnah about give this get to my wife, give this, give my slave, and the difference between Chavin and Zachim, Adam Shalom Fanav. And then can we infer from there to Tophis Labachov? And can we infer Tophis Labachov if you collect for a creditor, even if it causes a loss for others, does that work as well? And we saw different opinions about that. And perhaps it's a machloka Rabbi Lezer and the rabbis will continue with that in tomorrow's daf. Wishing everybody a chag Shabbat shalom and a shavuot tov if you're already up to that.